Our subject for tonight, how to read your boyfriend's mind or how to read your girlfriend's mind or your mother's mind or your boss's mind or God's mind. How to read the mind. Are you ready for the message? All right, just thought I'd double check. There is a popular conception, belief, idea, that we don't know what's going on in people's minds, and that's not true. If that were the case, all psychoanalysts would have to close up shop and find some other line of work. The Bible tells God's people how to know what's going on in a person's mind. Now, it may not be with microscopic accuracy, but it will be with a certain degree of reliability that will permit you to form and shape a proper Christian response to what you have detected in someone's mind. It is God's will and desire that His people not go through this world blind. They must know what is on the mind, particularly of the enemy. The way God has arranged this is found in Matthew chapter 12. All right, I can preach until a certain time if I like. I will not tell you what that time is. Matthew 12, reading from verse 33. And I'm using for public reading the King James Version. The Bible says, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known, how? By his fruit. Now this is a biblical principle, the tree is known by his fruit. You see, the fruit comes out of the tree, and by looking at the fruit, you can now retrace the steps of the fruit and come to an accurate conclusion of the source of that fruit. The tree is known by the fruit. Verse 34, O ye generation of vipers, how can ye that are evil speak good things? For out of the what? Abundance of the what? The heart. What is the heart? The mind. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, what happens? The mouth speaketh. It is impossible for a man or a woman to speak for a length of time and not reveal or betray what is in the heart. God has laid down that principle. What is in the heart has to come out if that person speaks or if that person acts. I believe that's why God gave us two of these, one of these, two of these, one of these. With these we listen, with these we observe. You see, my favorite writer says, words and actions reveal thoughts and motives. Let me repeat that. Words and actions reveal thoughts and motives that area of a person normally felt to be out of bounds to the outsider but the bible has given us a highway to the secret of the thoughts and the motives and that highway is paved in words and, and uh, actions how to read minds when god gave the ten commandments from sinai exodus chapter 20 he gave 10. Let's look at number 6. Commandment number 6. It simply says, Thou shalt not, what? Kill. If I were to ask, and I will not ask, how many of us here have ever killed someone, no hands would go up. If I were to ask, all murderers raise their hands, not a hand would go up. But do you know that 
Killing is much more than cutting someone's head off. Based on God's standard of right and wrong, God's standard is the inward condition of a man's heart. The Bible is very clear. Ye have heard that it hath been said of all time, Thou shalt not kill, but I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be guilty of the judgment. Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of all time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill, shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, this is Jesus, and when he speaks, he speaks authoritatively. I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, shall be guilty of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty of the counsel. And whosoever shall say to his brother, thou fool, shall be guilty of hellfire. What is Jesus saying? There is more to murder than the physical cessation of someone's life by some external force. When by unreasonable fits of anger, by attacking people, we reduce the quality of their lives, the Bible regards that as murder. The person can be fully alive. But if he or she suffers a a reduction in the quality of life, God calls that murder. It's murder that takes place in the heart. So what we have is the outward expression of thou shalt not kill, and none of us is guilty of the outward expression. Then Jesus came on Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, and shocked his listeners by saying, it is possible to commit murder in the heart in the heart now the law of california puts you in prison or sends you to the electric chair if you commit murder physically the law of california will not lay a finger on you if you kill someone in your heart are you are you following me This state, this country, will inflict no punishment on anyone who commits murder in the heart. There is no law against being angry. There is no law against resentment. There is no law against jealousy. There is no law against praying for someone to drop dead. There are no laws against that kind of internal behavior. But God has some strict laws against it. Which then must compel us to pause and reflect that there is more to the quality of one's moral life than what one does. Even the law of the land goes beyond behavior and tries to assess the mind. We said earlier today, there's something in law called malice. If you commit a crime and malice can be proved, if you, can, if you commit a crime and motive can be proved, lawyers are always looking for what is the motive. If there's no motive, then there's no crime. The case is weak if you cannot uncover a motive. Is there some large insurance settlement? Was he about to be exposed for something he did in some concentration camp? Is there a motive? Without a motive, the case is weak. Now, motive is not something physical. Motive is something from within. And the law of the land seeks out Motive, it seeks to examine, it casts a legal searchlight on the heart, looking for motive, looking for malice, looking for premeditation. Now, if the law of the land can do that, what about God's law? Let me tell you something about God. Almost five minutes after eight. Let me tell you something about God. God is a God of procedure and process and chronology. What do I mean? Simple example. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. You know it. If we confess our sins, He is what? 
faithful and just, say it with me, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is a step-by-step -step process in that verse. What comes first? Confess. Then what? Forgiveness and cleansing. Let's look at how this functions in nature. Mark 4, 28. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First, the blade. Then what? The ear. Then what? After that, the full corn in the ear. There is a step-by-step -step principle that functions in the spiritual world. It functions in the natural world. One thing must happen before something else happens. God is a God of step-by-step -step procedures. If that weren't the case, we could not depend on prophecy. Are you following me? We are a prophetic people. And we say in 457 B.C., Artaxerxes released the captives to go back and build the, the walls of Jerusalem. And we say in 431, Jesus Christ was crucified. We say in 434, Stephen was stoned, and we have it notched and marked on chronological charts, one thing at a time. And if something's not in place, someone will jump up and cause a spiritual ruckus. We believe that prophecy requires that things happen according to their place in a sequence of events. You know, that's the way it is with sin. Sin follows a sequence of events. God is aware of that. And He has made the appropriate resources available to us. Now here is the step-by-step -step process of sin. And we must understand as we continue with the subject how to read minds. The Bible says in James chapter 1, reading from verse 13, Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now, but every man is tempted when he's what? Drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's step number one. Then, when lust has conceived, it does what? Bring it forth. Sin. Step number two. And sin, when it is finished, if not confessed, bring it forth what? Death. Step number three. It is essential to understand this process in sinning for us to understand what I'm about to say. Let me repeat. Sin does not occur haphazardly. Sin does not occur haphazardly. It is procedural. It begins in the mind where the lusts of the flesh reside. The unconverted mind, the unregenerate mind, the mind described in Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be that mind. Now God has a remedy for sin. And the remedy has always been his righteousness. Now, if sin has a process step by step, the lust, the conceiving, the bringing forth of death, where do you believe that God has to place his remedy? At which step? Step one. Step one. The mind, the breeding ground of the lusts, the mind. Now, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. We shall read verse 33 as we continue how to read minds. Jeremiah 31, reading verse 33. Keep in mind, sin is a step-by-step -step process. It's not haphazard. It is procedural. It is a process. And in recognizing that process, God applies the remedy with that process in mind. 
But this is the covenant which I shall make with them, with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will do what? Put my law where? In the inward parts, and they'll do what? Write it where? In their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now God is saying, I will put the remedy right at the source, right at the origin, right at the headwaters of the river of unrighteousness. I will put my law in the hearts, in the inward parts, in the mind, wherever sin originates, that's where I will put my law. So at the very microsecond that sin begins to stir at the level of the thought, the law shines on that. God writes His law on our hearts. Because that is where it begins and that is where it should end. What do I mean by that? It should end. Many of us, we have a struggle with sin at level number two. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And that's a little late. Some of us, we don't realize we have a struggle. We'll only realize it when step three is inflicted upon us. Then sin, when it is finished, bring it forth death. And then there's no hope. But we must deal with sin at the level of the beginning, at the point of origin, at the point of departure. And that is the mind. And this is where God places the counteracting force. Which is His law. The standard of righteousness by which he judged the angels that fell. By which he judged that tremendous being that Jesus Christ created, Lucifer. When he sinned, he violated that law. God writes that on our hearts. Now you say, but preacher, how does he do that? Let me tell you how God writes it on the heart at our invitation. Come on, say amen. It is at our invitation. In Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, Exodus 31, verse 18, the Bible says, And when he had made an end of communing with Moses upon Mount Sinai, he gave unto him two tables of testimony. Tables of stone, finish that verse for me, written with the finger of God. Pause. Am I to understand that God the Father came down and actually wrote with his finger? Am I to understand that Jesus Christ, who was actually the member of the Godhead who came down on Sinai, whose voice shook the earth, according to Hebrews 12, and scribbled it with his fingernail? No. What is the writing agent of God? All right, someone said the Holy Spirit and someone spoke correctly. But let's demonstrate that biblically. The finger... Of God. That's how he wrote the commandments. Let's go to Exodus chapter 8. Let's read verses 18 and 19. As we continue how to read minds. And I hope you're praying that the Spirit of God will touch hearts even as I speak. And that God's Spirit will give me the right words. Because it is a very delicate, sensitive, and absolutely crucial subject. Exodus 8. Verses 18 and 19. This is the third plague. The plague of lice. Egypt have suffered the plague of blood. They have suffered the plague of frogs. Now God sends the plague of lice. By the way, it was not necessary for Egypt to suffer ten plagues. One should have been enough. And it's quite possible there are Egyptians listening to me now. God has sent one plague in your life to wake you up. But you're tough. One plague can't do it. You're too tough. So he has to send another one. But you're a marine, so you need three and four. Let me tell you something. When you push God, God will break your back. You ask Pharaoh. When you push God, God will break your back. God will kill you. If he sent a plague, you tell him real quick, Lord, one is enough. <laughs> Thank you. I've got the point. 
This is our theme for this restoration. I've got the point. No more plagues. And so the third plague came on Egypt. And when Aaron threw the dust in the air, there was lice on beasts and men. The Bible says in verse 18, and for verse 19, and the Egyptian magicians did so with the enchantment to bring forth lice. Verse, 19, verse 18. And they could not. So there was lice on man and beast. Now verse 19. Then the Egyptian, the magician said unto Pharaoh, this is what? The finger of God. You see, they tried, couldn't do it. When Moses turned the waters to blood, they did something that looked like it. Did you hear what I said? When the frogs were brought up at God's command, they did something that looked like it. But you can only go so far to imitate God. At some point, the greatness of God leaves you in the dust. They tried to imitate the plague of lies. They couldn't. And they confessed to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This plague is the finger. And we see it clearly. Let's go to Psalm 8. Reading from verse 3. 16 minutes after 8. Psalm 8, reading from verse 3. The Bible says, When I consider thy heavens... The works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers. Now go to Psalm 104 verse 30. Psalm 104 verse 30. Notice David talks about the works of his fingers, the created works. Psalm 104 verse 30, the Bible says, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. The spirit is the energizing force. In creation. Now let's go to the New Testament. The finger of God we're still trying to identify. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 12. We're looking at an incident where Jesus had cast out some demons. And the Pharisees always ready to explain away divine power. Accuse him of using the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 verse 28. But if I cast out devils. With the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Jesus said, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. Same story, this time reported by Luke. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. The same incident reported by Luke. The beauty of here a little and there a little. Luke 11, verse 20, the Bible says, But if I, by what? The finger of God cast out devils. No doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. If I by the finger, we have the finger in Luke eleven twenty. We have the spirit in Matthew twelve twenty eight. Same thing. The finger of God is the spirit of God. So when the Bible says in Exodus 31 verse 18, written with the finger of God, the Holy Spirit was the active agent in that divine inscription of God's law. Now, as he was the one who wrote it on tables of stone, it is he who writes it on the tables of our hearts. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3. The Bible says, For as much as he are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on fleshy tables of the heart. Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit has written God's will and God's law on our hearts. Why on the heart, not on the hand? You see, in Deuteronomy 6, you don't have to turn there. That's where Moses says, under God's instructions, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Then he says in the next verse, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. That's God's will. In thine heart. Verse 8 he says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Now, the Jews took that the wrong way. They felt that if they were to stuff a little bit of the law in a, in a, in a, in a leather pouch and 
put it here tied back of the head and put it here, then they had it in their minds. Or they would put some in a little hole outside of the door of the house or bind it around their house or put it in the post of the house, according to verse 9 of Deuteronomy 6. This wasn't what God had in mind. The sign upon the hand was to remind them that his law should be in their hearts. The only place God's law belongs is in the heart. Because when it is in the heart, it attacks sin at the origin. Now I said to you, this state or this country cannot punish you for hating someone. That's not a crime, but it's a sin. Are you with me? It's not a crime, it's a sin. It is quite possible there's someone listening to me now who resents someone else. Now, you don't go to jail for that. But God doesn't like it. And so you're condemned in God's eyes for that. Because while the state, as one pioneer wrote, calls for civility, God's law calls for what? Morality. Are you listening to me? God's law and morality is not what you do. Wait a minute now, don't think I'm giving you license to go say, well, I can do what I like. He said, that's not morality. Listen to what I mean. Morality is a matter of the heart. God's procedure, as I said, is if the heart is right, the behavior will be right. Is there someone here who does not understand that? Have you ever heard someone say, his heart is not in it? <laughs> and it's not a spiritual statement, but we somehow realize, we understand, we sense. It's almost instinctive, almost reflexive. You've got to put something in it that's not physical. I, I don't see that your heart is in it. I was watching a documentary on training for the SEALs. And I'm told that the SEALs training is designed to expose weakness. What is a weakness? It's in the mind. But they're seeking because they know if the weakness remains in the mind, it will endanger the mission. They're seeking to expose what is in the mind. The world does that. God's law does it. Now, 22 after 8. I have about 15 minutes. God's law is a moral law. No Christian disagrees with that. Because God is a moral God. Listen to me closely. How many commandments are there? Ten. Which one do you have to break to be declared an immoral person? Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. No one argues with that. An adulterer is immoral. Am I right? Yes. Six, thou shalt not kill. A murderer is immoral. But you're more immoral for adultery than murder. Thou shalt not bear false witness. A liar is seen as dishonest, not necessarily immoral. What we have unconsciously done, we have divided the commandments. This is immorality and this is bad judgment. Let me tell you something. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of what? The whole matter. Fear God and do what? Keep His commandments. For this is what? The whole duty of man. Now, the entire duty of man is encompassed in God's Ten Commandments. And it's a moral decalogue. Here's what I want you to get. And don't all rush to... Explain your points to me when the service is over. That's the least thing a preacher wants, a long discussion after preaching. Give me time to sleep, catch me tomorrow. If every aspect of our lives, whole duty, is judged by a moral law, listen to me, then everything we do is either what? Is either moral or immoral. You don't look convinced? Let me explain it this way. 
Let me talk to the men. You're watching a football game on Sunday. The quarterback throws the ball to the wide receiver. He catches it and starts to run. And the ref blows the whistle and does this. <laughs> What's that? Traveling. Can the ref do that? No, why not? It's not a basketball game. The rules are what? Football. And everything that happens must be judged by what kinds of rules? Football rules. Now, if on a basketball court, someone makes a fancy pass, then the opposing player hits him in the ribs. <laughs> Then you call the police. Because that's not football where you are legally allowed to kill someone. That's basketball. Now what I'm saying is, in life, God has a set of rules that, that, that judge the game of life. And those rules are entirely moral from number one to number ten. Anything you and I do is properly judged as either moral or immoral. Now, 25 after 8. Consider this. How many of you have ever broken the Sabbath? Raise your hands. Were we guilty of immorality, yes or no? Yes. Now, how many immoral people are listening to me now? Don't tell me. Don't tell, don't tell me. Don't tell me. How many of us have ever disrespected our parents? Mm -hmm. Was that an act of immorality? Yes. But if someone had said to you, you are immoral, you would have said, me? I've never committed adultery. <laughs> never killed. So I am a moral person. No. Listen to me. Everything we do comes under judgment. Listen to the verse again, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring every work into judgment. With every what? Secret thing, whether it be good or evil, what we do in life comes under one or two headings. Good or evil, there isn't a third. I don't care how creative your thinking ability is, there is not a third. It's either good or it's bad. How many of us waste time? Oh, don't raise your hands. You look too eager. <laughs> That's immoral. You see, immorality is that which goes against God. Not that which has you consistent with playboy or whatever else. Immorality is that which goes counter to God's standard of uprightness. If we would see our lives in the context of morality or immorality, there are many things we would not do. Because half-decent people tend to view immorality as something to avoid. Tomorrow I'm preaching on health. You know health is a matter of a moral necessity. Let me say that again. God requires, God has a moral requirement that we protect our health. You don't pursue some gym just to get into a size 26 dress. You do it because it's morally correct. It is required of God's decalogue under the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. So what I'm saying is, God is trying by the indwelling power of His Holy Spirit to develop a moral people. And when we understand that, it affects everything we do, every department of our lives. And the power to do it is the Holy Spirit within us. And the light of the law casting its light on everything that we do. And we see it to be wrong at the level of the thought. And that's where we stop it. My favorite writer says, who's my favorite writer? Ellen White, that's right. Who knows nothing about Ellen White? Raise your hands. You know nothing about Ellen White? Someone save that boy. We have to get him a book. Messages to young people. 
some Adventist friend get that boy a book messages to young people by Monday or tomorrow? Who else has never heard of Ellen White? Raise your hands. Good, good, good. Ah, just one. One distinguished, handsome young man. Messages to young people coming up for you. You don't get it by Monday, come and see me. When you get it, read it. She said, sin must be stopped at the level of the thought. At the level of the thought. Because once it just begins as a thought, we have not yet dwelled on it. It is not a sin for which we are charged. It is merely a sinful thought, a sinful impulse to which we have not responded. Other than to say, Lord, by your grace, I say no at that level. Let me tell you something that I do when evil thoughts come into my head. Do you know evil thoughts come into the heads of preachers? Did you know that? Perhaps more than your head. <laughs> Particularly when they're the heads of this size. Evil thoughts come into the head. Now here's what I do. I start quoting Bible verses. Let me tell you something as God listens to me. Before I can finish the passage, the thought is gone. Now let me say it comes back. The devil has a work to do. But we must be more persistent than he is. You see, when the devil came to Jesus Christ, command that these stones be made bread, what did Jesus say? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. I'm giving you a technique to use. Now Jesus didn't say it is written, keep the Sabbath. Why? It didn't fit. It didn't fit. Any verse doesn't fit. Your verse must fit the temptation. The temptation was turn these stones to bread. And Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. It is man shall not live by bread alone. It fit and the devil backed off. When the devil said, cast thyself down for it is written. He used the Bible too. Jesus said, it is written. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The devil backed off. Jesus said, it is, it, Jesus didn't say, mm, thou shalt not kill. When he came with the third all this will I give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. For every temptation, Jesus had a verse that fit the temptation. They tell me enzymes are shaped a certain way to fit some receptor. Am I right? Your textual enzymes must be properly shaped to fit that temptation. Because we have to deal with sin. Through the power of God's word. The Ten Commandments are God's word. God has no other standard to tell us what's right and wrong. This. If we would ask God, by the agency of His Holy Spirit, and under the direction of Jesus Christ, to write His law in our hearts, ask Him, you will begin to experience an opposition to sin. Are those all the amens I can get? Let me say that again. 8.33. The time they gave me was 8.40. I didn't want to tell you. I'll tell you now. We have seven minutes. If we will ask God to write His law on our hearts by the agency of the Holy Spirit under the direction of Jesus Christ, we would begin to experience a divine impulse, a holy recoiling from that which is wrong at the very point of His inception. And we will see to it by the power of God and the righteousness of His law that all sinful thoughts would be stillborn. Because we must hate sin like poison. If we would spend more time hating sin and not hating one another, we would be spiritually advanced far beyond where we are now. My beloved brothers and sisters, the kingdom of God is established in the mind. Not in uh, wherever the capital of California is, wherever that is. In Michigan, it's uh, Lansing. The kingdom of God is not established outwardly. Not yet. That's coming. But at present, it must find a place in the mind. That's where a moral person is in the mind. We are too behaviorally focused. Behavior has its place, but behavior cannot deviate from its origin. That is the mind. 
Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, a tree is known by its fruit. And God places his law, which is absolutely anti-sin, right at the point where sin begins. So that at point number one, we have power from on high. Because God's desire is that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Well, God says, fine, I'll put it right in your heart. Is there no one in this place who is tired of sin? You all right? How many of us are tired of sin? Raise your hands. You have to be tired of sin. Is there no one here who wants Jesus Christ to come quickly? How many of us want that? Can I see your hands? My brothers and my sisters, I speak from my heart. This is no joke. We must desire Jesus Christ more than anything else under the sun. We must hate sin. Don't you realize the very first promise in the Bible is a promise of hate? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. God has promised. Promise number one, I'll give you some hatred. It seems unusual for God to promise hatred. Yes, he does. But it's hatred for sin. Not sinners. Tonight, I'd like to leave this place believing with all my heart. That my brothers and sisters who have sat and listened have understood that the power to overcome sin can be placed right at the source of sin itself. That's in the heart. So that while we are born with a certain nature, when we are born of the Spirit, then we have an opposing force. That's the Spirit. And the Spirit has written... This, the law of right and wrong, right on the mind. The source of thoughts. How many of you will say, Lord, this message has affected me. I want you to put your law. Don't respond yet. I want you to write your law. In my heart. I want you to think before you respond. How many will say, Father, put hatred in my heart for sin. I want your law written ineradicably on the fleshy tables of my heart. So that I begin to do what's right naturally. If any one of you will say that with me, let me see your right hand, please. Would you confirm it by standing? Let, this, let God record this response. We must hate sin. We must hate sin. We must hate sin. It is sin that put Jesus Christ on the cross. It is sin that causes supervisors to mistreat those who are under them. It is sin that causes men to put their wives in hospitals. It is sin that has people strung out on drugs. It is sin that makes hospitals necessary. It is sin that causes children to run away from home. It is sin, it is sin, it is sin. And there is an answer that's the righteousness of Jesus Christ as expressed in His law. And I'm glad you're standing to say, God, this is a desperate cry. Write your law on my heart. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, if I in any way have misspoken, I ask for your forgiveness. The subject is so sensitive. If I have elevated myself, I ask again for your pardon. Father, I plead with you now in the name of your Son, whose blood still flows for our cleansing, that you would accept the response of your people. They have risen to say, we want your law written on our hearts by the active agency of the Holy Spirit under the direction of Jesus Christ. Lord, please, this is according to your will. It must be your will that your law be written on our hearts at the very source where sin begins. Write it there, God. Inscribe it, I pray, that we may be spiritual creatures, loving that which is spiritual, hating everything that is anti-God, hating that which is unrighteous, and hating sin. Give us a perfect hatred for sin. 
and a love for righteousness. Let your law be a living reality in our hearts that it may be seen in our fruit because the tree is known by the fruit. Father, in the name of Jesus, hear this prayer. Bless us tonight. Bring us back tomorrow to hear more of your word. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let all God's people say, Amen and Amen.